I have a little saying that for me kind of sums up the essence of spiritual practice. And, uh, and that is uh, <coughs> remembering God is bliss and forgetting God is suffering. So, <clears throat> Ananda Marga is called the path of bliss because what, what gives the blissful feelings? You know, when you keep your mind on being, oneness, love, God, that's what creates bliss, right? Um, as distinct from happiness or pleasure or, <clears throat> or whatever. And so when one's mind is moving towards, when is focused on the spiritual, that creates the blissful feelings. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and when you forget, then your mind is moving towards something else. And you're losing that, uh, the quality of, you know, the calmness and whatever that really is at the essence of, of bliss. So <clears throat> mindfulness then really is, is at the core of remaining blissful. Um, and personally, I'm, I find it a real struggle to be mindful all the time, but I'm grateful because there are so many things in an Andamarga practice that make you be mindful that, uh, <clears throat> or help you, some little things that we do during the, during the day and so forth. So I'll mention some of, talk about those. And I think the, the, yoga approach to mindfulness is also a little bit different. So whereas in Buddhist mindfulness, it's kind of like more about being present right in this moment, uh, aware of your breath. And I think mindfulness from, from Ananda Marga definition is being mindful of the divine, mindful of the spiritual, your mantra and so forth. So keeping God in your thoughts. And um, and looking at the you know the concept of, of bliss and what really gives us a feeling of pleasure, when the mental waves become straightened, right? when our when our waves are agitated, um, <clears throat> we feel uh, more stress. And the longer the mental wave becomes, the more relaxed and calm we feel. And why I say that, that you know, remembering God is bliss and forgetting God is, is suffering is because when you're thinking of the divine, the nature of the divine is this long, not a vibrational thing, but a long... Uh, you're thinking of something infinite and something perfect and complete. And so the mind, as you contemplate the divine, you become what you focus on, right? So <clears throat> the mind becomes like that. So we are seekers of bliss. And the amount of bliss in our lives is pretty much related to the amount of mindfulness. We experience where we put our attention. So the more we are able to train ourselves to put our attention on that inner oneness, um, the more we will experience it. Right? Mindfulness is a process of gradually strengthening the focus on inner oneness and weakening the focus on the surface duality. Right? So. <clears throat> Um, if a monkey wants to jump from one tree to another, then there's two things that are happening. One is letting go with one hand and catching with the other. So one aspect of mindfulness is just 
you know, reminding oneself of that this world passes away. You can't find absolute happiness or permanent happiness in, in an environment which is by its nature not absolute and not permanent. Right? So that kind of self-reminding or non-attachment. And some disciplines say that if you are simply non-attached, um, that's enough. You know, if I'm not attached to this or that, if I'm completely detached, then the rest will come by itself. Swami Shivananda teaches like that. That just being detached from the world itself will leave you naturally in a blissful state. So letting go or non-attachment in Sanskrit, that's called vairagya, detachment. And the other aspect, so on the, on the one hand vairagya or detachment, and on the other hand abhyasa, which means focus, steady focus. Right? So <clears throat> these are the two kind of complementary aspects of deep um, engagement being able to let go of all other objects and distractions and at the same time being able to steadily focus on, on your spiritual idea. Mantra is a convenient tool um, <clears throat> because it's a, a simple object that you can focus on. So it gives you some anchor point or point of focus. And at the same time, um, different kinds of um, ways that work with human psychology to stay mindful. For example, Baba made an interesting little comment that it's kind of difficult for the human mind to think of the divine because for a finite mind to grasp something which is infinite is by nature quite difficult. To get around that difficulty, um, imagine not that you are thinking of the divine, but the divine is thinking of you. And if you just um, hold that idea in your, in your head, it's a little bit easier to grasp than to kind of keep your mind on the infinite. So just as you wander around and go through your day, imagine that loving consciousness is witnessing you. And... <clears throat> As he explained this practice, he said that this little practice is the most important secret in the universe. Um, <clears throat> and it seems such a simple thing to remember that you are being witnessed by the divine. And why would it be such an important secret? Um, but transcending this sense of doership, I am the doer, the ego, is the main challenge that we have to face in, in the spiritual journey. So by keeping the, the sense of being witnessed, you are transferring that uh, subjecthood from the ego to the divine. So, you know, as long as you don't have that sense of being witnessed, then I am witnessing, I am doing, I am thinking, I am seeing. So you are the subject, whether you like it or not. But as the moment that you bring that idea that the divine is witnessing me, um, you become the object and the divine becomes the subject. Right? And as soon as the divine becomes the subject, then uh, the ego is getting reduced. Right? 
So this sense of the, the more often that you can keep that sense of I am being witnessed, whenever you do that, the, your own position of subject and ego is getting reduced. And the, gradually that transforms the sense of the divine is witnessing me becomes also the feeling that the divine is not only witnessing me, but the divine is creating me. Right? My existence is dependent upon the witnessship of the divine. The divine is witnessing not only me, but you and everything, and not only witnessing, but creating, sustaining, holding. So the, the more you hold that thought in your mind, the more the ego role uh, becomes less, and you get a growing feeling that the, the divine is doing everything. And that brings its own feeling of sweetness and bliss. So internally, when we do meditation, there is vairagya, non-attachment, and abhyasa, steady focus. Um, So part of our process in meditation is withdrawing the mind, that's part of the detachment, and then steady focus on the spiritual idea is there. And you can do that in your meditation also, to think that as you're saying the mantra and thinking of the divine, also think that the divine is the subject and you are the object, right? So you're being witnessed, you're being held. Baba gives the beautiful example where uh, of the salt doll. You've heard me say this before. So um, a doll made of salt decides to go and explore the sea. So it starts off as the subject, and the sea is the object. But as it goes into the sea, the sea becomes the subject, and the doll becomes the object, and the sea absorbs the doll into itself. Right? So if you keep that image in your meditation, it's also helpful. You think of the infinite ocean of divine love and consciousness around you, and who is doing the meditation? Am I, with my little mind, absorbing and conquering the infinite, or is the infinite absorbing me into itself? If you read the literature of the different spiritual traditions, you'll you'll often see many kind of truths are shared and just spoken in slightly different words. And one of them is that you often see is if you take one step towards the divine, the divine will take 20 steps towards you. Right. So if that's true, then who's doing most of the action? Right. Yes. Pretty much all the action, right? I remember one sweet thing Baba said. He said uh, regarding meditation, your job is just to sit there. The rest is my responsibility. I, like, I often say that to myself when I'm sitting down and feeling a little bit scattered and hopeless about focusing. I just, I just say that to myself. My job is just to sit there. The rest is, you know. So, <clears throat> a nice thing to keep in mind. But then when we open our eyes and move around, there are also aspects of vairagya and abhyasa. Um, And those two aspects are uh, nicely represented in uh, in a a quote from a a woman called Marianne Williamson that inspired me. I can't remember what the rest of the book was about, but this one quote I remember very well. Um, Fear is illusion and love is the only reality. And at times when I've been facing a lot of difficulty or felt fear, I, uh, that little saying comes to my mind a lot. And so it indicates that the two aspects of letting go or reducing the strength of the duality and increasing the strength of the oneness. So fear is illusion. 
right? Letting go, that's the detachment part. Weakening, you're weakening the, the hold of the dualistic worldview on yourself, right? Of separateness. Um, <clears throat> fear is illusion, love is the only reality. So the second part of that little phrase is strengthening the underlying worldview of love and oneness. So here are some of the things uh, that Baba taught us over the years. Um, from the moment that you wake up to the moment that you lay your head on the pillow, there's little things that you can practice to help you stay mindful. And the first one, as we... As, as you begin to become conscious, the moment that you wake up, try to sit up immediately. Don't just lie there in bed, but sit up in the, immediately. Focus on your crown chakra. And, I mean, for those of you who are doing Anandamarga practice, we visualize our guru sitting in a lotus in the crown chakra with his, uh, with a particular mudra. Um, it's called Barabhai Mudra. And it means um, <clears throat> don't fear and I am giving you everything. Okay. So it's a expressing a certain blessing kind of thing. And then we repeat a mantra and that becomes the first thought of the day. Right? And in yoga, it's taught that the first thought that comes in the mind as you begin your day sets the tone. So if you start with that focus in the crown chakra and um, visualize the guru, then that sets a particular direction and, and tone for your day. And whatever follows will tend to be um, influenced by that first setting. So if some of you would feel that you are, you know, would like to learn that practice, then we can teach you the mantra that you use at that time. And the other thing that should be done right at the, the beginning of the day um, is to remember your initiation promises. So when we take initiation, we make three promises. I will not do any harm to anyone consciously. I will do good to others according to my capacity. And the secrecy of what is taught to me will be maintained strictly. So <clears throat> just starting your day with those thoughts of not harming others and doing good to others, again, sets a positive direction and tone that helps you make a good start for the day. In English, there's a little saying, a good beginning is half the battle, right? Then another uh, practice as we get on to the day, one of the first things that we do is take a shower or a bath. And uh, Baba gave us a mantra that we use for when we take a bath. And after we've had our bath, we face the direction of light. If you're outdoors, the sun, or indoors, uh, a normal light. And with your body wet and the water, the drops of water still on your body, you uh, do a mudra like this and recite a mantra. So the mudra goes like this, then like this, then like this, and down and over, around like that. And the mantra is, Pichi Purusepio Namaha, I salute the ancestors, 
Risi Devebio Namaha. I salute the sages and the wise people who have benefited humanity with gifts and inventions and wisdom and so forth. Um, Brahmar Pranam. Um, Brahma is the one who is offering. Brahma Havir. Brahma is uh, that which is offered. Uh, Brahma Pranam Brahma Havir. Brahma Gnau. Brahma is the fire of the offering. Brahma Nautam. <clears throat> um, and I think Brahma is the one who offers something like th- that's the order. And then Brahma Eva Tena Gantavyam Brahma Kama Samadhina. So you will merge into Brahma when the work is complete. So the combination of the mantra and the mudra, which is repeated three times, um, again, it makes your bath a spiritual practice. Um, it, it activates the, by repeating the mantra with the water on the body and doing the mudra, it helps you to draw energy from the light into the body. So it has some benefit there. And uh, often when I say the mantra, I think of the dadas who, through so much hard work, helped to create and build up this place, which we enjoy today. And, uh, and remember those who have contributed, done so much service work to help humanity in one way or another. And if you are engaged in some kind of social service work and you remember all those who have gone before you, you feel like somehow you're part of a line and you're kind of helping to carry on the work. And it's nice to make that connection. And I kind of feel sometimes, especially when there is a lot of responsibility or challenges or so forth, I feel somehow the presence of those previous guardians and, and, and their spiritual presence and, and that when I'm open to it, it's, uh, you know, they are helping. Then we also have the practice of uh, doing a half bath. So as well as being physically refreshing, it's, um, it's also a little ritual. It's a reminder so that instead of just, you know, sitting down and eating your food without thinking about it, first you prepare yourself, you have a wash. You, it has a kind of purifying and calming effect on the mind and makes the whole eating process a little bit more spiritual and civilized. So doing that before meditation, before sleep, before eating, is just spending a little extra time to, you know, prepare yourself and do something in a nice way. Um, <clears throat> Although it's not a particular, you know, um, we have our two mantras that we use. So one is called Ishta Mantra and one is called Guru Mantra. So the Ishta Mantra is one that you say with every breath. Um, <clears throat> and there's a concept for um, perfection in mantra. It's called mantra siddhi. And, and that is when you are, you have become so accustomed to repeating your mantra that it begins to become automatic and it goes on without effort. So it goes on when you're asleep, when you're awake, it just continues by itself. Um, <clears throat> so when you've trained yourself long enough to remember the mantra that it becomes subconscious and it goes by itself. That is called mantra siddhi or perfection in mantra practice. So then in, it, in addition to that, we have the guru mantra, 
which we train ourselves to, to practice as we start each new activity. So <clears throat> you've heard about uh, preventive medicine. So Guru Mantra is kind of like that. You know, by remembering the Guru Mantra before you start, and basically the, it reminds you that uh, myself, the doer, is the divine, the object of doing, the action itself, the person that I'm engaging with is also the divine. So that type of um, you know, eyes open mindfulness and pausing and taking a so just taking a few seconds before you start any new activity to remind yourself about that. And there's a beautiful story uh, about that, um, which was told to me by very senior Dada, Dada Nitya Shudnanda. And he, uh, Baba was giving some talks about something called Microvita. Perhaps we'll have a, a class on that later. And he needed um, a, what do you call a person who, who uh, you use to demonstrate something on? When like an, a magician calls somebody up from the audience to... A stuntman. Yeah, stuntman, guinea pig. A guinea, guinea pig, pig or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> So he said he needed a volunteer from the audience to, to show, to give a demonstration about how Microvita works. So uh, this Dada Nityasudananda who told me the story, he put his hand up and walked forward. So as he was walking forward towards Baba, um, ha when he was halfway there, Baba said to him, uh, no, uh, not you, somebody else. And this Dada was hurt uh, because he had volunteered and he didn't understand why Baba had rejected him. And then the other, another Dada was chosen. He came forward and, and Baba did the experiment for everybody. So uh, he had this hurt feeling. And the next day, Baba called him to his room and uh, explained to him why he had not chosen him. And he said the reason was that as he was walking towards him, he remembered his guru mantra, his second lesson mantra. And that is, he repeated the mantra and took the idea. And he said, because you repeated the mantra, the experiment wouldn't work. And the other dada that he chose had forgotten to say his guru mantra, and therefore he could do the experiment. So that illustrated the power of the mantra to um, preserve or protect you from influences that are coming from the outside. So actually it was a compliment that he was rejected. So the Guru Mantra is very powerful and, and those of you who have received the Guru Mantra and who use it, you will know and feel the difference between remembering to use it and not remembering to use it. Um, another thing that we are encouraged to do is to keep a daily diary and to monitor our various points. So those of you who had the class on the 16 points, I gave you a chart, um, <clears throat> and you can use that. And so basically, this process of self-monitoring also increases mindfulness. If you have a point, let's say you have some qualities that you want to grow in yourself, like forgiveness or seeing good in others or things like that, and every day you just run through a little check. How well did I do that today? Right. That itself, if you just do that every day, will develop those qualities even if you don't do anything else. Right. And here again, there's a beautiful story 
about um, when before Baba had revealed himself as a guru, he worked in the government uh, railways. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he had disciples at that time, but none of them knew who each other was. Right? So they were not allowed to reveal that they were, he was their guru because he didn't want to have the situation in the office where he is being, having to function as a government worker and is also a guru. So he kept that completely quiet. And, um, but nevertheless, everybody in the office felt some special relationship with him. And it was the time of uh, one, one of the people who had been working in the office for a long time got transferred. So they decided to have a going away party. And during the party, um, one of the people gave him a garland. And this man was one of Baba's students. And he felt that he couldn't accept the garland because his guru was there. So he gave the garland to Baba. And Baba returned the garland to him and said, keep this garland in your house somewhere where you can see it every day. And that's what he did. And then uh, he went to this new place and started his work there. And in the place where he, he was working, people began to make comments about him that somehow every day this person became a little bit better. And, um, and the man himself somehow had the feeling that by every day as he went out of the house, he followed Baba's instruction and looked at that garland and then went. So he felt it was something to do with that. Um, it would be kind of nice to have a, a garland like that, don't you think? That you could just look at it a little bit every day and somehow become a better person. But in a way, I think we have, we have been left such a garland, not in a physical form, but if you think of those 15 points outside the, your dormitory, you know, forgiveness, magnanimity of mind, and so forth, and all those good qualities, by looking at them and refreshing them and just monitoring, uh, you know, thinking about how well you were able to follow them, just by doing that once a day, that will help those qualities grow. So this practice of self-review and keeping a diary where you, you think about what happened to me today, what can I learn from it, helps us digest our experiences, hel helps us take wisdom from them. So I don't know who it um, was, but I think a Greek philosopher or something said that um, an unexamined life is not worth living. Plato, mm -hmm. yeah. So <clears throat> the idea is that you know we should be reflecting on what life is teaching us. So spending some time every day is another aspect of mindfulness to look back, reflect, and so forth. Another uh, practice that you can follow. Well, Dadas and Didis, we have to meditate uh, four times a day. It's open to other people to do that. The trainees are trying that now. And I often feel thankful for that because it forces me to take half an hour out of the middle of the day to, you know, do some meditation and and I know if I didn't do that every day, I'd be a lot more scattered than I am normally. So having those you know, um, <clears throat> regular meditations, for me anyway, I very much admire some of the people who seem to be able to live their life without having to do meditation. But 
I know I couldn't be one of them. Um, as soon as I reduce my meditation time or miss a meditation, my, my calmness and peace of mind goes out the window completely. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> And then the last thing we do before sleeping, um, and this is a, just a cute little secret, if you want to have spiritual dreams, just write your mantra on your pillow before you put your head down. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there you go. There's our daily routine of different uh, practices that we do, and they all help in one way or another to, to keep ourselves um, focused and just to remind us of um, our spirituality. To conclude, mindfulness is really the activity which defines us as humans. Right? We are no different from other creatures if we are not mindful. But if we are mindful and you know, having our spiritual focus and in touch with that, then that adds our special quality of, of humanness. And it is by this practice of mindfulness only really that that brings us the the deeper happiness the absolute happiness and and the progress that we are looking for and um, and for that reason perhaps more than anything else it is what needs our attention and our work Thank you very much. We have a little extra time. Does anyone have any questions? If you're taking notes like as a reflective exercise, how would you navigate or find a balance between reflecting and then stimulating the ego? But what do you mean by stimulating? Like if, you're, if you're writing notes every day about yourself. Oh. Hmm. Um, but I think if if you are, um, you know, keeping track of, you know, like how often did I say the mantra or um, how well did I follow my... You know, maybe one of the things that you could reflect on is how mindful w you were during the day. Um, how well did you follow your ethics, your ethical principles, and, you know, how often did you get lost and completely lose track of yourself? That's the type of reflection I'm talking about. Yeah. And it can be who am I reflection as well, you know. So what did I, what did life, what is life trying to say to me at the moment? So it means listening more. Maybe you could also say, like, reflect on how mindful is the universe, like your children or like your inner self. And I don't know how mindful they are, but how mindful is the universe in the quotation. I feel attracted to the to the morning and to the evening protection. But so if the mantra you're writing is that could that be the first mantra? Yeah. Yeah. And when you wake up in the morning you just sit up. If I say I'm not attracted to the one you what what is the essence of the mantra? Or um it's pretty much related to that. 
So it, some instructions about visualizing the lotus and the form of the guru, how to do that, and and you know what to repeat. But it's it's related to the guru's name. Mm. So it's some kind of Yeah, um, it deserves to be included. So doing a bit of kirtan every day, and I mean, it's not a varta kirtan isn't normally a a part of everybody's daily practice. It's usually something that we do when we're together in a group. Um, so that's maybe why I didn't include it. Oh. Another little thing, which we just briefly discussed on Monday, I think, was uh, there are some kind of things we do in a group, as we're going to talk about that. So doing the six-direction kirtan before sleeping and uh, also singing kirtan before eating. So when, when you're in a group, it's very nice to bring a bit of mindfulness to the meal by singing kirtan before. Tara, yeah. you mentioned um, an important part of mindfulness is the feeling that you're being witnessed, that we are the object. Mm. How can we do this in, say, kirtan or... Um, yeah, in kirtan, for instance. Um, I don't think it, it should be any more difficult to do. I can't s think of anything different about the kirtan when we do that. Maybe you have some experience in that? Um, I mean, what I do, what someone said to me was when you sing, feel that you know, something is singing back to you. Right. Ten times or you know, Right. There's a feeling comes that I'm not singing, but the singing is coming to me. Right. Yeah. Mm. In the heart circle, you get a strong experience of that. Where I struggle to to <coughs> to uh, be mindful, I guess, is when I'm doing something difficult, like I don't know, um, climbing a tree and cutting branches and doing something using a chainsaw. Then I, I guess I, I have a sense of presence because I need to be very present and aware whilst I'm doing it, um, so I don't make a mistake. But I find it you know, very hard to repeat a mantra or something like that. Mm. Do you have any suggestions? Well, no, but um, I think maybe the daily diary and reflection on that will help. But I'm remembering a story from a Russian book called The Way of a Pilgrim, which talks about a, a monk who's wandering all over Russia in search of a way to be in constant prayer. And he asks one master, um, is it possible to, to remain engaged with a spiritual thought while you're working? And the master said, yes. And, and he said, but even when you're doing intellectual work, which is very complicated. How do you keep that sense? You know? And the master gave a very interesting reply. He said, let's say you are uh, working for a very, very powerful king, right? And the king asks you to write a letter and you, to write the letter in front of him, right? So you have to write the letter, but it's very probable that as you're writing the letter, you don't forget that the king's sitting right there, right? So the fact that you can write the letter and be conscious of the king sitting there was his way of saying that, yes, it is possible, even while doing intellectual work, to be, you know, uh, maybe not easy, 
but definitely possible. Thank you. All right. I've been asked to finish a little bit earlier so that people have a chance to get ready to the, for the class. Okay. If anyone who isn't going to the yoga class wants to stay and ask some more questions, you're welcome. But uh, Bimal is ready to receive you. Thank you. Namaskar.